my friend Sherry. We're going to be talking about puppy fitness. Um, and Sherry, for those of our viewers who haven't met you before, can you quickly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure. I'm Sherry Sprague. Thank you everyone for watching. Uh, I am a physical therapist and have been for over 20 years uh, with the past 13 years of that being canine rehabilitation and fitness only. Um, I got certified in canine physical therapy uh, 12 years ago and I have my own business, Pup Rehabilitation and Conditioning, uh, that I have had for two years in Georgia and over five years back when I lived in Florida. Perfect. All right, so we're here tonight to talk about puppy fitness. So far we've had um, several talks on the importance of puppy socialization, um, and we wanted to talk about puppy fitness, what it is, uh, why do we need it, and how it relates to puppy training and um, socialization. Um, so Sherry, um, how would you describe puppy fitness? That is a great question. Um, before I directly answer that question, um, I wanted to talk a little bit just in general about puppies um, that will then lead me into puppy fitness. Um, because puppies' brains and bodies have not fully developed um, and they have not formed their movement patterns um, quite yet. Um, the ability of the brain to form and develop those connections is called neuroplasticity. And the really amazing thing is that we have the opportunity to teach puppies at their young age while their brains are forming and uh, learning to move, um, how to move properly. Um, and by focusing on teaching them proper movement patterns um, and how to be more aware of their body when they do certain movements in their daily life, such as sit, lie down, stand up, back up, um, they're less likely to do them with compensatory movements or poor movement patterns. Um, so then, therefore, puppy fitness can help with those connections by focusing on not just having fun with your puppy, but while having fun with your puppy, teaching them how to use their bodies better. Um, and this is done through those normal movement patterns and teaching them what's called proprioceptive awareness, which is the brain's ability to know where their body is in space. Um, this in turn helps to lay the foundation um, to help set them up for success while decreasing injury risk um, and any awkwardness that they may have while they're growing. All right, and how, what would you say is the difference between puppy fitness and just regular exercising? Yeah, so the focus is going to be very different than exercising an adult dog. Um, puppies don't need strength or endurance conditioning until they're a little older, um, at least nine months of age, um, for some giant breed dogs that may even be later in life. Um, so their focus is going to be on um, tapping into that neuroplasticity and really focusing on their proprioceptive awareness, um, how they're using their body, where their body is in space, knowing and learning that their back end can move separately from their front end. Um, so their fitness is going to also be much shorter um, as far as their sessions. Uh, versus an adult dog, you could spend 20, 30 minutes if you wanted to working on their fitness. Um, but they're gonna have much shorter sessions um, and everything's gonna be focused on good movement patterns. Um, I also recommend with puppies during those short sessions, even taking little breaks to have some fun, maybe a little game of, of tug or um, hand touch or something um, that's gonna take their mental brain away from the work that we're doing with them. And that's not necessarily something that you need to do with an adult dog. Mm -hmm. um, and it's too, um, some of you might not be aware, but puppies um, have their growth, growth plates still open. So those don't close fully until oh, yes. they're a little bit older. Um, well, I'm going to actually get into that. So I'm so glad you're mentioning that. Yeah. So I was just going to ask, you know, what are safe activities? But, Taking into consideration that our puppies' growth plates are not fully closed, we do have to take precautions. We can't just um, do anything um, willy-nilly. We do have to be careful. Um, so what are safe activities that we can do with our puppies? 
Yeah. And for those of you who don't necessarily know about growth plates, um, what growth plates are um, is it's soft uh, developing tissue that are at the end of long bones, um, such as the femur bone in the leg, um, the ulnar bone and uh, radius bone in their front legs. Um, and while they're growing, um, you want to make sure that those growth plates grow at an even rate. Mm -hmm. So any type of injury um, can cause or, or, you know, issue can cause damage to the growth plates or the cells around the growth plates, um, which could then lead to stress to the tissues or even deformities. So, um, yes, safe exercises are particularly important um, because while puppies are growing because they're actually more prone to injuries during strenuous exercise. So, and the reason for that is because they do lack coordination, proprioceptive awareness, um, strength. Uh, so safe exercises are things to make sure you're avoiding any high impact activities like frisbee if it involves jumping um so maybe rolling the frisbee on the ground um especially on any kind of hard surfaces um, jumping or jogging like on pavement um, so you want to make sure that puppies have good soft forgiving surfaces um, and any kind of sustained vigorous activity or rough play um, would be recommended to avoid right now um, so safe activities would be those I mentioned earlier where you're taking them through normal movements that they would do every day. Um, and that's where the combination of your knowledge with training puppies uh, is combined with my knowledge because teaching puppies different tricks and commands and obedience such as sit down, um, you know, healing nicely on a leash can be very much incorporated into their fitness. Um, and so that's where, to me, it's very important to start teaching puppies those different movements and watching how they're doing those movement patterns, um, which leads me to then discuss things like sloppy sits. Mm -hmm. um, so those sloppy sits are where a puppy, when you ask them to sit, might either shift to one side or one hip. Um, or roll all the way back onto their haunches so that they're not actually sitting up tall and using their bodies the way that they should. Um, or the same with a down. Um, they may lie down and instead of that nice straight sphinx position, they may automatically just roll onto a hip. Um, so this is where not just teaching the command is important, but watching that they're doing these movements properly with good movement patterns. Um, some people like to teach, for example, a down where the puppy does roll onto a hip because they're teaching more of like a settle command. Um, but so then that's where I would stress trying to teach both. So maybe using two different commands, like down means a good straight sphinx down and maybe settle or whatever other command they would want to choose to have them roll off onto that hip. So that's where the training aspect comes in. All right, and then timeline-wise, when would you say is a good age to start introducing those more strenuous activity, like going for hikes, going for jogging? Um, and is it different by kind of breed of dog or by size of dog? So don't get me wrong. I think it's important to walk puppies in general, no matter what age they are. Um, I think that that actually promotes a lot of well-being for them. It helps give them confidence to get them outside and about and experience the world around them, um, different noises, different sights, different smells. Um, going on hikes is also great because walking on those uneven surfaces and challenges of sticks or puddles, um, leaves, things like that, different surfaces are really great for puppies. Um, and I don't I don't discourage that at any age. So my own puppy that I have, Finesse, um, I had her litter and 
even as young as six weeks old, we have a wooded area that's fenced behind us and I would let them all run free um, in the wooded area. So that's the key though, is the running free part. Mm -hmm. So I strongly suggest and recommend if it can be done safely, um, allowing more free play, free roaming, free romping, um, be it whether it's on their own or with you or with a you know a housemate um, as young as eight weeks old, um, and that you allow the puppy to make that determining factor as to when they want to rest or lie down or take a break or go get a drink of water um, versus a forced, and I use the word forced, um, not in the sense of making your dog do it, but forced in the sense of unleash. Um, so a forced walk on leash, usually owners walk out, they have a goal in mind, oh, we're gonna walk for 20 minutes and then I'm gonna turn around and I'm gonna walk back. Um, and then therefore that's more of a forced activity. So um, if the puppy can go at its own pace and you wanna do a leashed walk, that's great. Just make sure you don't have a timeline or an agenda involved with it and you just are going at the puppy's pace if the puppy wants to walk if the puppy wants to trot if the puppy wants to lie down if the puppy wants to sniff that you are on board with all of that and then when the puppy is looking tired you either are turning around and going home or calling how you know a husband a partner a friend to bring you back home type of thing but i do try to give a guideline for people it's not black and white because it does depend on the breed and the puppy um, but i do try to give a guideline for people who do want to go out for an actual walk or hike with a young dog um, to try to calculate for every month your puppy is old five minutes mm -hmm. so for example a three-month-old puppy should not be going for any longer than a 15 minute walk or hike. And again, at that puppy's pace. So if you wanna go hiking with your puppy, just know, all right, it's not gonna be for an hour long if I have a three month or a four month old puppy, unless you're willing to carry the puppy. I actually know people who do that. They have backpacks, they stick their puppy in or they put their puppy in a wagon um, so that they're still getting the experience of being outside and about. Um, right now with the pandemic going on, I think it's even more important for us to be outside and getting fresh air and allowing our puppies to be out of our homes and experiencing sights and sounds while they're growing. Um, and I know that that's also something you stress as well is giving puppies experiences. So that's again where I think it's important to give them that mental stimulation, the brain stimulation, um, as well as helping to build their confidence. Yeah, and for sure. And I always tell people with puppies a lot of times too, when we start working on walks, I see the same thing where people are um, focused on getting a certain distance in or a certain duration in um, and not allowing our dogs to stop and sniff and see. And that's actually the most beneficial thing for a puppy is being able to sit and watch the world go by when you go on walks. Um, let them sniff different spots because that's how they're creating those nice experiences and, you know, kind of taking in their environment. If they're just trudging through, let's go, let's go, let's go, they don't have a chance to really kind of pick up on what's going on around them. So you do want to make it um, as easy for your puppy and making sure that you go at their pace and allowing a lot of stop time. And especially with um, shire puppies or puppies who seem a little bit overwhelmed with what's going on, a lot of times allow them to stop and watch things for a few seconds, even a few minutes is really helpful because they can take things in um, think about them and then they have the confidence to keep going so that you're not kind of struggling with your puppy trying to get them moving when they don't want to go moving you know I would say with puppies um, your aim when you go outside is really for them to have a good time outside and to see things and experience things not to get a mile in or get 20 minutes in you know that's I think that's an important point to to drive especially with young puppies um, so Sherry, what would yeah, you say? And, and just to touch on that, because exactly that, um, with those walks and hikes, the goal shouldn't, shouldn't be endurance and yeah. building endurance. And so it, you can take that time to really train uh, and 
you know, somebody opening a mailbox. And so not only are they experiencing the person being near, but the noise of the mailbox or a flag waving or a car going by and, or they want to sniff and experience the world through their noses. Um, so yeah, the agenda should be more about having fun with the puppy when it's out and about versus, oh, I want to hike for a mile. Um, so again, that's why I like to give that time frame for people. You know, they have a six month old, seven month old puppy. They want to tire the puppy out. So they think, well, if I take it for an hour long walk, that'll do it. Well, but in actuality though, you may be doing damage to the tissues. So mm -hmm. maybe make it an hour long walk, but 20, 30 minutes of it is taking in the sights or teaching a, you know, a look at me command or a watch it command. Um, you know, so just making experiences positive for them. And so going on walks, so, you know, we pretty much talked about how people can having that <clears throat> set um, distance or um, minute count um, is detrimental when we talk about puppies exercise. What um, other kind of top three mistakes do you see people often doing with their puppies when they're growing up? Yeah, um, and a, a big one I do see is definitely the you know, I, I'll see a four month old puppy on a hike that I'm an hour in and, um, you know, I cringe. But other things I see um, people making the mistakes of um, are a lot of repetitive motions such mm -hmm. as stairs, you know, a lot of stairs going up and down and up and down. Um, I, mean, I have flights of stairs. Uh, but when my puppies were young, when I, I, I tried to carry them as much as I could, again, you have to, you have to be safe for yourself. If you're not safe carrying your puppy, then you may want to consider blocking your stairs off, um, or just making it a one time a day thing. So they maybe go up the stairs for bedtime and then down the stairs in the morning for potty, you know, to come back down to the main floor. Um, but I do see a lot of that, um, or just repetitive motions in general, such as ball chasing, frisbee, um, jogging. Um, and another one I see and hear a lot about are poor traction or slippery surfaces. Um, so not giving puppies good traction on their flooring. I mean, we all have tile, we all have hardwood laminate. Um, LVT, they're all very popular. Um, but when we ha have growing puppies with growing tissues, and again, those, as we mentioned, the growth plates, um, we want to make sure we're giving them good traction on the floors. So even if it's a matter of getting some rugs or runners um, and, and putting them in a pathway where the, the, the puppy is maybe going outside or to the front door, um, maybe right outside of their crate. So as they come out, when you release them, they have good traction, um, definitely around water bowls so that they're not slipping um, around the, the bowls if they drip any water. Um, but I would say those are the, the three main ones, um, you know, exercising or repetitively jogging or sleeping with puppies for too long, poor traction um, and repetitive motions. All right, and when we work on puppy fitness, do we need to use any special equipment? Do we have to get, um, you know, cavalettis? Do we need wobble balls? Are there things that are particularly useful for puppies and things that are not safe for puppies to use? Yeah, that's a really great question. And maybe another thing I probably sometimes see owners make the mistake of is getting puppies on certain equipment too early. Um, there's really not a need for puppies to be on unstable surfaces with all four legs for extended periods of time, such as peanuts or discs um, and the bones, all of those. Uh, I think that they're great for puppies once again to be exposed to from a surface standpoint and a confidence standpoint. So maybe teaching them to walk over it or onto it and off of it, or just experiencing the wobble board as it tips and they walk off, um, but not for a sustained period of time. And maybe just putting front paws on or back paws on. Um, so there's not really special equipment I recommend when I go through puppy fitness, um, except 
stable surfaces. So I do like um, things such as I love one of my favorite pieces of equipment are the rubber horse bowls um, that mm -hmm. you can get from tractor supply because they actually provide a lot of traction and you can get them in different sizes. So you can get them for small breeds, medium breeds, large breeds, um, and they're very inexpensive. So they're a really great piece of equipment. Um, step stools are a great piece of equipment. Again, if you know, you're trying to teach a puppy to put paws up on something. Um, I do think it's important for puppies to experience different surfaces. So um, the little nubs that are on the, the discs or on the pods um, or the wobble boards sometimes have different, um, uh, like a sandpaper type surface. So I think it's great for puppies to experience them, um, but I wouldn't keep them on for prolonged periods of time and I wouldn't have them with all four paws up onto it unless they're a little bit older, um, maybe six, seven, eight months old. Yeah, you do want to have that controlled on and off. You know, with very young puppies, they don't usually, I mean, they have a hard time standing and walking without wobbling all over the place. Right. Uh, a lot of times with very young puppies, you see that when they put four feet on something that's very wobbly, they'll just kind of, whoa, whoa, and then they'll topple over. Right. That's that you want to for sure avoid. Right. And so if we're already dealing with puppies, as I mentioned earlier that are already uncoordinated or already have some decreased proprioceptive awareness. So you put them then on a surface that has a lot of move to it and they really then are going to struggle because they don't have the proprioceptive awareness to be able to catch themselves properly um, or step where they need to be. Yeah. And then that can just risk injury over time. So, um, what you want to mainly do is watch how they move and see if they can do it in a good controlled fashion on a good flat surface with non-skid um, flooring, such as carpet or a yoga mat or a bath mat, and then begin to slowly introduce them doing it on other surfaces. But something as simple as grass now has changed the difficulty and the level of it um, or a pillow put them on a you know a bed pillow or on your bed um, type of thing so you're changing the surface but you're not giving them these great challenges yet of something like a disc or a, or a bosu which is the one that's flat on one side and domed on the other um, so yeah before i really start introducing unstable surfaces i want to make sure they're moving properly um, in their on, on stable surfaces and in different environments yeah, and that brings up a good point too. I think a lot of people, when they think about fitness in general, they always think about equipment and doing, just like with people doing fitness exercises, there are very specific um, strength, tra strength training or cardio. Uh, but with puppies, you know, even basic things like going from a sit to a down with a young puppy is really difficult. I always tell people, uh, puppies laying down have a hard time because they don't know they can move the front individually from the end and they don't know how to kind of place their feet so that they go smoothly into a down. Um, so I think, you know, the focus a lot of times gets a little bit misplaced into doing equipment and, and stuff and people forget that even through basic obedience, especially with young puppies, you can still cover some you know, of that proprioception, you know, teaching your puppies how to move in a circle, how to um, go from standing to sitting, from standing to down. Those are all really neat um, coordination exercises that you can do with your puppy while still working on kind of obedience skills. Um, and that's yeah, and I love incorporating obedience, basic obedience into getting a puppy to use their bodies better. And the thing also that people don't necessarily know or realize is once a motor pattern is formed, the brain never forgets it. So you can maybe reteach it, but it's much harder to reteach something versus if you create good motor patterns from day one, you don't have to even work on reteaching it. So, right, just beginning with some of those basic obedience cues, that can be what can be considered fitness in and of itself. Yeah, and I would say too, um, some people, especially when you have a dog that is, you know, prospect for show or for sport, um, then, you know, you kind of want to incorporate um, that physical training into it too. So are there any differences, you know, 
puppy fitness wise for a dog that would be um, a pet dog versus a dog that is a show or sport prospect? Oh, that's such a great question. Yes. Um, yes and no. Um, they all across the board should have that same basic fitness um, and the focus being on that neuroplasticity and developing those good motor patterns. However, for example, people who uh, compete in agility, uh, they tend to like to start training puppies very young. Um, not necessarily on equipment, but even on the flat, meaning just on the ground, starting to teach basic um, types of, of commands and for puppies to learn to learn to follow your body cues so that when they become an agility dog, your body cues, they learn to read and understand what they mean. So teaching those things early on is super, is, is even more important because if they can learn let's say for example, something like learning, as you mentioned, turning. So turning left or turning right. And you start teaching them that what the verbal cue means or what your body is gonna look like if you want your dog to turn left on the agility field or turn right on the agility field. If you start to train those patterns early on the flat in the quiet of your home where there are zero distractions, then begin to start to give them harder challenges such as maybe now take it outside or maybe start giving them some other distractions. What they are doing is starting to learn how to process your cues either verbally or physically with your body early on in life. And they are setting themselves up to then once they've learned them be easily challenged when you now start to add at an appropriate time something like a jump. They've already learned how to use their bodies properly to turn left or turn right when you either say it or move. And now you add the jump. Well, all they have to learn now is how to put the two together versus actually learning the movement patterns as well as combining it with something like going over a jump. So I do think it's important to start to train some of those things on the flat and letting them learn those good movement patterns early on. So then that way it's going to, it's going to help them succeed and decrease injury risk later on in the future. For sure. And one of my favorite things to work on with puppies are pivots when they're really early on, because first of all, it's a really nice um, fitness exercise and, you know, um, body awareness because it does require them to move the back and the front independently. Uh, but it's also a really nice foundation for healing because if you can work on pivots, then you get that really nice smooth pivoting into heel. It looks like really nice and flashy. Um, and that's really hard to teach, you know, once your dog is an adult, if you're trying to teach the concept of focused heel, plus how to move your body all at once, it can be really difficult for dogs to get. Um, it can be quite frustrating for the handler. So when you have those foundations as a puppy that the pu dog already knows how to move very smoothly into that position and away from you, um, then you really only have to build that focus and the duration of the behavior. You don't have to build the whole thing from scratch. Um, when they're older and it's and again like you were saying you know <clears throat> with neuroplasticity and learning patterns motor patterns really early on um, those are really easy to learn when the brain is in still you know early development like puppies have uh, once those connections start to close when puppies get older and when they get into early adulthood um, they can still learn obviously but it, it requires more effort <clears throat> um, and especially when it comes to coordination and motor patterns those are really hard to get um, at a later age versus um, just like us when we're kids, you know, it's easy when you're a child to learn how to ride a bike pretty quickly when you're an adult. Uh, if you had to learn from scratch, it's, it gets a lot harder. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, that, so and yeah, and that's with any task. And especially if you're um, very big on shaping. Yeah. So when they're developing their brains and their body and you're working on shaping, and again, this goes back to when you had asked about the sport versus the pet dog, 
to me, shaping can go across the board, but again, using your, your body, sometimes moving your body a certain way can help you start to shape certain movements that you want from your dog. And so now they're also really learning to read you and look to you. Um, and again, you're, you're doing that very early on and you're creating that bond, but you're also helping that neuroplasticity at a very young age and teaching them to look to you for cues. Yeah, and working early on, you know, bringing up shaping is a great point because shaping is a technique I love to use. And so it's pretty much all about breaking down um, a complex behavior into small pieces um, and rewarding incremental steps towards your final behavior. Um, and it's a really useful technique to use with very complex or difficult behaviors that your dog has a hard time um, putting together so that they don't get frustrated. Um, and so with shaping, but the good thing is because you're breaking down behaviors into small pieces, it's a lot easier to get that nice cohesive um, final behavior. And with puppies, that means you can start early on because you break it down to the smallest step, which is appropriate for their age and development. And you can work on that and then gradually build up to what you want them to do in the end. Um, and also shaping as a concept is great because it really teaches puppies um, to offer behavior and to kind of like, oh, okay, I have to figure something out. What's the next step? And what do they want now? What do they want now? Oh, this one, that one, left, right, which way? Uh, which is really cool because then when they're older, it's really easy to teach them new stuff. I see it with my dog, um, Kaylee. You know, she picks up things really quickly because she knows that she offers stuff and then she kind of figures out what the pattern is. Oh, okay, this time you rewarded this. Uh, you wore that again. Okay, so I'm on the right track. So it's kind of like playing hot and cold. Um, and dogs that have experience with shaping early on are really good at playing the hot and cold game. And so they figure out new behaviors really quickly, which is really, really neat. Um, and especially if you're going to do sports, because that, that is very helpful. Um, and I would say, too, re regarding sports, um, and especially I want to talk about show dogs and show mm. prospects. Um, mm -hmm. because show dogs obviously structure is very important um, and so does puppy fitness have an impact on a puppy's structural development that's such a good question and again also here now we're looking at normal movement so what does a dog have to do in a show ring they have to trot mm -hmm. and they have to stand and so first off teaching them both of those are really great so even teaching the stand command and what you're looking for um, as far as a stacked stand versus just standing um, is important but um, teaching them to trot properly can certainly be done i know you mentioned earlier cavalettis and actually that that i should have mentioned that that is also one of my favorite pieces of equipment for puppies so i apologize i should have mentioned that earlier but to answer your structural question um, we actually can have an effect on structure um, while puppies are growing um, because number one, teaching them to use their bodies properly, of course, is going to then help them grow and develop better. Um, if they are doing, for example, those sloppy sits, as I mentioned earlier, um, they could be sitting off to one side, let's say it's always off to the left. So they're going to overdevelop certain muscles and underdevelop certain muscles. Um, so that certainly can affect their structure. Um, we're not going to necessarily affect the way their structures develop because that uh, genetics plays a big factor in that. Um, however, we can certainly have an effect on structure if we're noticing some weaknesses um, in certain muscles. Um, and we can certainly have an effect on structure from the negative standpoint if we manage to somehow damage those growth plates. So um, we can have positive and negative effects um, on structure. Um, those repetitive motions can certainly play a role um, on the growth plates um, while puppies are developing and they're especially during growth spurts, puppies can get especially awkward. Um, so trying to tap into their brain to make sure they are still moving properly and with the most efficient methods possible um, and the least compensatory methods possible can absolutely affect their structurally, them structurally in a positive manner. 
All right, and here we have a question that's really interesting because we were just talking about sits. So Penny asks, oh. how, how long would you teach a tuck sit and how would you teach a puppy how to um, sit in a tuck? So for those who don't know, tuck sit is a really nice square sit where our puppies front and back end are really just very much aligned and parallel um, so that they don't shift their weight um, to either side or kind of fall back and slouch um, like here. So tuck sit is a nice straight um, square sit. So Sherry, how, how, I mean, can you teach very young puppies how to tuck sit? Absolutely. And as I mentioned earlier, I would be teaching that right from the beginning. So when you're teaching the command sit, um, and you are looking for that nice, good tuck sit. And and puppies definitely move in different manners when they go to sit. Some do what is called um, a walk back sit where they will walk back into the sit. So they'll walk their front legs back and roll into the sit with their back end. And some will do where they will keep their front legs pretty stable and bring their back end underneath them. There are certainly ways to teach both, and I'm actually a big believer in teaching both for two reasons. Number one, I like teaching it um, because we tap into different muscles when we do it, but also because certain sports require one versus the other. Um, in obedience, uh, most people prefer the sit where the front legs don't move and the back end tucks underneath them, um, which again is a big, um, it really calls in that proprioceptive awareness. They really need to know and understand where their back end is and how they're going to use it. Um, so I would be teaching that penny right away, um, a nice, good, proper sit. So they're not either sitting all the way back on their haunches or off to the side. And as far as if you want to teach a specific one, the way I uh, focus teaching one versus the other is um, if you want the one where front legs stay still or stationary and the back end um, tucks forward and they go into their sit that way, I will put their front paws on a marker um, that's not very high. So maybe an inch or two high you can start with like a foam pad um, or something stable and you teach them as they sit if you use a clicker I, I like to use a clicker um, but you only mark the ones where the front feet stay on the marker and the back end goes underneath them click and treat um, and then you can slowly start to phase out that marker that the front feet are on um, and if you prefer the other method, then I would do the same type of thing where I would put that marker um, underneath their back end um, and even lower them with the treat towards their nose so that they walk back with their front paws and rock back into that sit. So hopefully that answered your question. I wasn't sure if you meant just a nice straight sit or if you meant a, meant a tuck sit in the way of the back end coming underneath them. All right, and we have another really good question too. Let me put it up here from Imani. Um, how do you determine proper body condition on growing puppies um, and adjusting feeding based on the body condition? I know that can be a little bit awkward. Uh, puppies, especially when they go into the sprouting stage, what I call it, which every week they just keep doubling in size. Yes. Um, it can be really hard to adjust the food appropriately. So I know some puppies go through a very lanky um they look like they haven't been fed enough stage. Um, and on the other end, I see some puppies who are plump um, and yes. haven't kind of grown into themselves just yet. So how, how do you kind of make that call on, on young puppies? Amani, great question. And thanks for joining us. Um, yes. So puppies uh, should not be overweight. They should not look like chunk monks as much as we love little chunky monkeys and think they are just so adorable. It is so bad for their growing and developing and their tissues. So, Oh, good Penny. I'm glad I answered your question. Perfect. Um, so yes, that's a great question. And as Camille mentioned, you do have to sometimes just look at your puppy because they could be going through that sprout phase where literally you leave for work and you come home and you're like, what happened? My puppy just grew, you know, five pounds. So 
Um, the way I look at puppies is the same as the way I look at adults. Um, and my hand is the best way to uh, give you guys that advice. So if you look at your hand, and the best thing to do actually is to close your eyes and just let lightly rub your fingers over the knuckles on the back of your hand. And you shouldn't be pressing hard. And that is exactly how your dog's ribs should feel when you rub your hands over their ribs, even on the fluffiest dog. And what you would do is you would get through the fluff and then you would rub your hands over the ribs. If you make a fist, here, where's my fist? Okay, there we go. If you make a fist and you rub your, it's so weird compared to the camera. I know, it's, it's, all, it's, it's, it's like all backwards. Um, if you make a fist and you rub your fingers over your knuckles with your eyes closed, especially, um, I feel much better when my eyes are closed because you take out a sense. Um, this is too thin. If you turn your hand over, where am I? Oh, here we are. And you put your fingers on your knuckles once again, and you very lightly rub your fingers over your knuckles. You can feel that little fatty layer. And that means your puppy is a little overweight. So you should be able to feel your puppy's ribs. Um, you should be able to see a nice waistline. Um, and you should be able, looking from the side, so looking from above the waistline, looking from the side, you should be able to see what's called an up tuck. So going from the front of the dog at the chest up to the abdomen, it should slope upward. Um, but the big trick that I do constantly with my puppy, and Amani, you know, I have a seven month old puppy now, is I'm constantly just feeling her ribs. Literally, I probably put my hands on her ribs to actually check for weight because they go like this as they're growing. Um, so what I'm feeding her today, next week may be too little or too much. So I literally probably put my hands on her ribs every fourth or fifth day and say, okay, are you getting too much or not enough or perfect? Um, and it's based on what I just explained. Um, and sometimes you may have to add more and sometimes you may have to take out a little bit. Um, it also will depend on how active your puppy is. So if you have a much more active puppy, they of course are gonna burn much more um, and more calories. So they may go through a very active, you know, couple of weeks, they, they're they ready and raring to go. Um, and so therefore you may have to add a little bit of food in there. Yeah, and that was a great question too, because a lot of times too with older dogs or adult dogs, when they're overweight, a lot of times people will use exercise as a way to lean them out. Um, and with puppies, that's something that you don't necessarily want to do. You want to adjust the food first. Um, and then if you don't see, um, any kind of improvement and you know you feel like you've reduced the food to a proper amount um, and again dog food you know a lot of people are surprised my 80 pound german shepherd which is behind there she eats um a cup and three quarters a day and she's a pretty active well she's not any well she's a little less active right now but she's a pretty active dog and when she was at her, the height of her activity she would eat two cups of food a day um, and so when i go into houses where I have a 60 pound dog that's eating 45 cups a day, um, I'm always a little bit surprised. So of course, you know, food are formulated differently. So the calorie intake is not the same. Um, but I would say, you know, most commonly people tend to overfeed their dogs um, because they feel like, oh, well, you know, portion, we have to fill their stomach and kibble is concentrated, especially if you're using kibble. Remember that it is pretty concentrated nutrition. So even though they're tiny little pieces, they have kind of a lot of calories packed in there. Um, so a lot of times, you know, ration your dog's food, lower it. A lot of times because we tend to overfeed anyway, um, you actually can lower quite a bit. Um, and with puppies, again, you know, that, exercise should really be your last line of offense if you want them to lose a little bit of weight for sure. Yeah, and the dog food companies don't help because they recommend vast amounts of food for dogs and owners, you know, are going on what they're reading. So, uh, you know, I always try to educate my owners on that hand trick because don't read the bag, um, but go on how your puppy or dog um, looks and feels. Um, and, you know, Camille just said how much her dog eats my adult six-year-old adult Australian Shepherd eats three cups of dog food a day 
Um, and he is extremely active, um, so his calories can be more. Um, but on occasion, I have to cut out his calories if I can't feel those ribs. If, if they're feeling more like this and not like this, then he'll get fed less. So it's always based on that. Perfect. And so we talked, you know, a little bit about fitness for sports dogs and show dogs. Uh, but, you know, I want to stress, too, that it's important even for pet dogs, so dogs that don't have um, a career in sports um, or show world. Um, and then can you talk to us a little bit about why, you know, pet owners, uh, people who don't want to compete um, in sports with their dogs, would still benefit from teaching their puppies, um, you know, basic puppy fitness? Yeah. And I mean, every puppy can benefit from fitness because it goes back to that initial question um, of how it can benefit, how fitness can benefit. Um, it's creating those good normal movement patterns and making sure um, that we're tapping into that neuroplasticity as young as we possibly can. Because as I mentioned, once a motor pattern is formed, um, once they've learned a certain way to do something, it's so much harder to change it. Um, and if they're using compensatory movement patterns or they're favoring a side over another, um, or they're moving in not the most efficient manner, it sets them up for injury. Um, so your everyday pet dog can still be at risk and will still be at risk because it's still running around, it's still playing, it's still fetching, jumping on and off the couch. Um, so making sure the puppy is using its body in the safest manner is going to set your dog up for success. Um, and help, as I mentioned, to decrease injury risk, which is really the ultimate goal. Preventative medicine is always easier, cheaper, and safer than curative medicine. For sure. And also, I would stress, too, that, you know, um, puppy fitness is also about creating that relationship and our bond with our dogs. It's a really nice way to do fun training activities. Um, a lot of times, CLC owners are very focused on um, obedience for their puppies. So they want their puppies to sit, to stay, um, to heal. And, you know, those are difficult skills for puppies and not always the most appropriate young puppy skills. What you really want to do with young puppies is build that relationship with your dog and um, teach them that training is fun and that, you know, it's a good time together and that we can work together to um, have fun. Um, it's also a really nice way to work on your training mechanics. Um, because training is also a mechanical skill where you have to have good timing with your clicker if you're using a clicker um, or if you're using a verbal marker, you need to have good timing. Um, luring dogs or using treats to get them to perform a certain behavior takes skill. Um, it's not always easy to move the right way, um, especially with dogs who are um, really, really sensitive to body movement. A lot of times um, you can teach your dog inadvertently how to do something because they keep following you body movement like down where they respond to you leaning over but they never learn <laughs> guilty yeah and then this is it this is it and this is down yeah. yep um and so, yeah. you know, working on those novel exercises um where you don't have a clear specific end result sit or down is really helpful in kind of working out your thought your mechanics and training mechanics um, and I like it too because it's a nice way to work on socialization. Um, you know, you can introduce novel new textures as part of your little fitness routine, which is really nice for puppies. And again, you're you're building those neural connections. Yeah, and it not only you know, and of, of course, I love the bond it helps create between owner and puppy, but it also helps from a fitness and socialization and obedience standpoint to help keep the puppy's mental acuity, um, yeah. keep them sharp and keep them focused on the owners and, and learning cues from the owners. So it's really just reinforcing and enhancing all the things they're learning from the obedience and training standpoint, um, and then putting it into more of a fitness component as well. Oh, but Sarah anyway. Beth has some good questions. Yeah, I'm going to post. Uh, so Sarah Beth, <laughs> I recommend discussing exercise restrictions to clients. Uh, yeah, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult mm, to explain mm -hmm. to our puppy parents. Welcome why to my world. <laughs> are, are not allowed to run around uh, all day long. Um, and so that's a really nice question. So how do you usually address kind of that concern right there? 
Yeah, and you know, hopefully, Sarah Beth, this um, live is helping you in the way of being information that you'd be able to then take back to your clients. Um, you know, it's all about education and educating them um, with your knowledge. So, thank you for watching, actually, because. That's my, that's our goal is to help educate anyone who not just has puppies, but who works with puppies. And so educating them and explaining to them about the joint, the, how the joints are still growing and the growth plates and tissues are still forming and any kind of rough play um, or excessive repetitive movements running around um, or on hard surfaces, asphalt and pavement. Um, explain to them how that can actually be detrimental in the long run and maybe even be cause for injury um, and that you're just looking out for their their puppy's well-being um, and that small short little sessions um, would be a much safer route to go um, and on good surfaces um, and explaining about what Camille was talking about in the way of if they want to exercise their pet outdoors um, to let it just be on their puppy's terms and to make it more about fun um, and life experiences versus um, strength or endurance work because puppies don't need that yet and they shouldn't be getting it. Yeah, no, yes, and it's definitely also, go ahead. Yeah, and I would say especially, so as Beth is also asking about specific yeah. um, agility foundation students, which I know with, when you have an agility puppy, you want to get started right away and teach yeah. all the good mm -hmm. right away. Um, and the hard part with puppy too is that you don't see the damage you're doing, right? So when you have your puppy jumping over and over and over and over, okay, my puppy's not limping, she's fine, she just cleared that jump five times in a row. You're not seeing the damage it's doing to the growth plates, um, that's all invisible and that will creep out three, four, five years later. Uh, pretty much as when your dog is started in agility and you're starting to get titles and that's when you're going to have to retire your dog because they can't compete anymore. Um, so, you know, it can be difficult for people to understand because you don't always have obvious signs of lameness. Uh, but I would stress that, you know, um, it, the damage is happening whether you see it or not. Um, and then in the long term, that's it, it's even compounded because as your dog gets older, um, arthritis can kick in, you know, um, they get sore anyway. Even dogs who are in really good physical condition, when they get older, they have a hard time with simple tasks. They can have a hard time going upstairs, um, doing more physical activities. And so if on top of that, they've had puppyhood trauma, um, that makes their the senior age a lot harder for them. So you do want to be careful. And then that goes for pets too, obviously. Even if you're not competing, you don't want to put stress on your puppy and then have an adult dog or senior dog that's, you know, pretty much in worse condition or in, in pain because they've had all of this um, early trauma that you haven't seen um, and it's been building up all this time. And that's a great point because a trauma might occur and it could be something as you know small as a strain or sprain that right maybe at that given moment the puppy's not showing any symptoms or any major symptoms and a couple days later puppy's fine oh okay off we go um but i can tell you trauma does absolutely lead to tissue changes um it might be minor or it could be as significant as arthritis developing over time. Um, and the number one reason for injury, <laughs> most people do not guess this correctly. Um, the number one reason for injury is a history of a previous injury. <laughs> so Sarah Beth, I know the agility community. I am an agility enthusiast. Um, so I know how eager they are to get those dogs on the start line. Um, but explaining to them what we just mentioned is important. Um, Dogs should not be jumping full height until their growth plates are closed. Um, and they should not be weaving closed weave poles also until they have growth plates closed. Um, for some dogs, that might be as early as nine months. For others, that might be 15 months. Um, so, you know, if you are teaching agility class, you have a little bit more leeway to be able to say what is going to be or not going to be. Um, but you know, for your own dogs, it's, you know, unless people ask for your advice and I can tell you doing what I do, not everyone even asks me for my advice, so I can't always give it. Um, and I see a lot of mistakes in that regard of people starting things way too quickly, but your best bet is to do 
a lot of things uh, on the flat um, or with very, very low um, like jump bumps and things like that so that they're not getting that repetitive pounding and, and high impact. All right, and we have another question, a really good one from Chelsea, who says, um, so if we can't run with our puppies and we can do long walks, um, how can we get our high energy puppies tired? That's a great question. I love that. I, I So I am, again, I'm not discouraging or saying don't go on leashed walks with your puppies. I just came in from a leashed walk with all three of my dogs, my puppy seven months old. Um, and again, I try to follow that five minute rule. So she's seven months old. So I could safely take her for 35, 40 minutes straight, but I've also worked her up to that. I wouldn't just take a seven month old puppy that I've not really ever walked for that long and then go out tomorrow and go for 35 minutes. Um, I have worked her up to that. Um, but what you can also do to tire puppies out are so many different things, mind games, mental games, teaching them new tricks, um, engaging them in different activities, just going outside and giving them new experiences, new opportunities. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical activity. Um, it could be a puzzle, a puzzle game, a snuffle mat, feeding them out of different um, types of food toys. Um, so it doesn't necessarily always have to be go, 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 go. Um, to me, the other negative behind that is if you have a high energy puppy and your answer is to just constantly go, 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 what you're teaching them is to go, go, go. Yeah. And then they never learn to settle. So I actually would then be calling Camille and Chelsea as to how do I teach my dog to settle? I have yeah. a high energy dog. I, I agree with that. I see a lot of people with high energy dogs who um, resort to high arousal activities to get their dogs tired. So let's play frisbee, let's play fetch over and over and over and over. Um, and what tends to happen is your dog um, never gets tired um, because mentally they're still going like, ah, ah, ah. so you never get relaxation. And what you actually do over time is you're actually building your dog's stamina. Um, and so they can do it longer and longer and longer. And soon enough, through three hours, it's not enough and they're still not tired. Mm -hmm. um, and so mental stimulation is the most important um, part of stimulation for me. And I have an active dog. I have a German Shepherd um, who has, you know, working drives. She likes to do stuff. Um, and we do do physical activity. She still needs physical activity, obviously, to be in good physical shape. But most of our stuff that we do are mental stimulation. So we go on walks, we go hiking, not for three, five miles, but in a new spot so that she can have new smells. And we can, oh, check this out. I've never been here before. Who's been there? Oh, there's a stream. Let's walk across the stream. Why? Because it's an experience. It's fun. She has to go downhill. Then she has to climb on some rocks so that she's using her mind and she's figuring things out. Uh, we also do a lot of mental stimulation games at home. So we have lots of different food puzzles that she can work out. So that same thing, she has to use her brain and figure out how to get the food out. Uh, we do training at home. I do short sessions with her um, in the yard. We'll do five minutes of heel, okay, down, okay, stay. Okay, heel, down, let's stay. So they're not high impact activities. I'm not making her run back and forth the yard nonstop. Um, but I am engaging her brain um, and making her use her brain and also doing physical activity that's most likely to tire her out because I'm actually asking her to use all of her muscles in different ways um, by asking for specific movement, right? Pivot into heel, down, stand, walk backwards. Those are nice because they're kind of using different muscle groups. Um, and so you're getting more of a physical workout that way. And you're also adding mental stimulation so that in the end you have a dog that is going to be tired, actually tired and relaxed um, without having all to do all of that repetitive, um, uh, not safe exercise. Yeah. And I actually, I love all those things you just mentioned because the other thing is what Camille was mentioning was she was throwing a bunch of different things out. So get into heel position, down, sit. And the other thing that that helps is we're going back to those motor patterns. If you have a dog where you're just constantly sit down, sit down, they start to know those smart dogs start to figure out, Oh yeah, she's going to ask me to sit now. She's going to ask me to stand now. She's going to ask me to sit. And they just start throwing those behaviors. But if you start throwing different 
commands at them, well, now they really have to think and mm -hmm. they have to motor plan because they're going, well, wait, oh, I thought she was gonna ask me to sit, but now she's asking me to down. Oh, wait, now she just asked me to sit and I thought she was gonna ask me to stand, but she asked me to give her a paw. So I have to think about this. So you're really tiring them out because you are challenging them physically and really challenging them mentally. Um, now, and the other thing, Chelsea, to answer your question is, I also am not completely against some of those activities um, like ball or Frisbee. I do it, well, I don't personally, my husband does Frisbee with our puppy and we always have our, I have Australian Shepherds. For those of you who don't know, I have active breeds. Um, and they do want to work, um, but they are very short sessions, three to five minutes, and none of the Frisbees come off the ground. So they are all rolled on the ground. Um, any kind of ball playing, uh, we combine with obedience. So we may ask her to sit and wait and throw the ball. And once the ball has landed and has stopped moving, we will release her to go get the ball and then are teaching her that comeback command. Bring it, come back. You can put your dog on a long leash um, so you can work on that type of obedience skill as well, that they go and they get the object or toy. It doesn't have to be a ball necessarily. And they learn to bring it back. Um, so they are moving and running. Um, again, I mentioned a lot of off-leash running. If you have a fence backyard um, or a friend who has a fence backyard, make sure they're a really good friend and or or invite them to dinner and go use their yard. Um, or if you have any kind of wooded area um, and you can let the puppies off leash, those are great activities as well for helping to tire puppies out. Um, but I have an acre of fenced wooded area and just letting her run around, my seven month old puppy run around in there for 20 minutes and she's exploring and climbing things and going over you know, rocks and bushes and branches and leaves. She comes in and she's happy. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, let's go jogging for an hour with that seven month old puppy. Perfect. Um, and so just to recap for you guys, we've been talking oh, about- Anna has a really good question. Uh, oh, there, I missed it. So we have one last question from um, Jaina. How do you know when the growth plates close? And that's a really good one for sure. That's a great question. Um, I can tell you typically most dogs growth plates are closed by 15 months, unless they're a giant breed. However, if you want to know for sure, um, I had a client whose border collies growth plates were closed at nine months. Um, if you want to know for sure, 100% an x-ray. That's the only way 100% you will know that answer. Um, so if you're wondering, cause maybe your dog's getting close to that age and you want to start some certain things with your training, um, getting an x-ray from your veterinarian would be the best 100% way to know. Perfect. All right. So just to recap, we've been talking about puppy fitness, um, and we've, you know, we pretty much covered, um, why it's important, um, not only for dog, but for sport prospects, cause a lot of times something that gets, um, implied that fitness should really be only for puppies who are going to do agility or working puppies um, and that pet puppies don't really need any kind of um, physical fitness. Uh, but like we discussed, you know, it's a really nice way to build that mental sharpness um, and to take advantage of um, our puppies' plasticity of the brain when they're young that they can learn pretty much anything um, <clears throat> to create those nice proper correct motor patterns because we do want them to move um, properly so that they don't injure themselves in the future. Um, it's also a really nice way to incorporate socialization because you can use different types of texture and surfaces um, as, as your little um, platforms for your puppy so that you're building in that novel stimuli. Oh, this is fun. We're going to step on something else today and work um, on sitting on it so that you can have um, that exposure to different um, items around the house um, and it's also a really nice way to set up training um, and to create that nice bond with your puppy and have fun with your puppy um, by doing fun activities that um, are going to get your puppy both physically tired and as well as mentally tired. Um, and if you guys want to learn more about uh, proper puppy fitness and puppy socialization and kind of all the puppy basics, Sherry and I are doing a class together, an online course. 
uh, which we're calling the Pandemic Puppy Socialization and Fitness Class. Um, and we're going to go over uh, pretty much, you know, safe, appropriate exercise for puppies, socialization, especially in a time of the pandemic where it's not always easy to get our puppies outside. Um, so we, we're going to give you guys some creative um, ideas on how you can substitute outside time with um, fun inside activities so that you're still getting that nice experience and you're still getting um, your puppy exercised properly without having to necessarily be outside um, if you cannot be outside. Um, and we'll also be talking about crate training and resource guarding so that we're covering pretty much all of um, the puppy critical skills when they're young. Um, and we'll post a link to that in the comments. If you have any questions, um, you can still post them in the comments. We'll be checking the feed pretty regularly so that we can answer any other questions you might have for uh, myself or for Sherry. Um, and we want to thank you all for watching us. Thank have you.